Pete McCall is joining us tonight. Pete is the host of the All About Fitness podcast, a personal trainer and author. Pete, welcome to the show. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for having me on. And to your listeners, thank you for tuning in. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to visit with you a little bit. And for those of you that want visuals, this will also be on YouTube. But Pete, let's start off with a question that I ask all my guests. So far today, what non-negotiable things have you done for your health and performance? A non-negotiable? I, uh, I, well, we were talking about this. I was at a car dealership. I had to wait for my car to be repaired. And I pretty much stood the whole time. So in, there's, a, there's a lounge there where obviously you have chairs, you can sit down, they have whatever was on the TV, and they had like a standing area where you could sit there. But having been there before, I'd brought my computer with me and I was doing some work, but using it as a standing desk. And that, that to me is almost non-negotiable, Nick, is we sit enough throughout the day that anytime I have an opportunity to stand while working, like right now we're having this conversation, and I, I choose when, when I'm recording to, to try to stand because I think I, I, I feel that I think better when I'm on my feet. But anytime I have an opportunity to work while on my feet, I try to do that. So that really, to me, was, was non-negotiable. And then when I need to go get coffee, uh, rather, than, rather than have the shuttle bus drive me a half mile to the coffee store, I went for a walk and went and got my own coffee. So, um, yeah, that, just doing little things like that, if I don't get a chance to work out right away, doing little things like that, looking for what many people call those activity breaks are super important to me. And I really try to factor those in. A lot of times I think that it has to be this dedicated block of time and effort into a health optimization activity, but it's really becoming the MacGyver and looking around your surroundings and making do with what you have. For example, when I'm on a long plane trip, I will get up, walk around a bunch, in the airport, I will find things to use as standing desks that aren't typically used for computer work. And it's really just that like inventor's creative mind that allows you to stay healthy without dedicating huge budgets or your entire life to it. Well, to your point, I mean, I, I do enough travel and, and a few years ago, a colleague of mine had a, had a club membership um, on United. And so for the last maybe for the last decade now, going back to 2011, I've had a United Club membership when I travel. And I have to tell you, Nick, that makes all the difference because at every club, they have standing desks, they have places, and you spend enough time seated on an airplane that to be able to set your bags down in a club, it's an expense, you know, it's like three or $400 a year. But when you travel often enough, it comes out to like 20 or $30 a trip. But to be able to leave your bags somewhere, walk around the club and do laps around the club when you're waiting an hour and a half or two hours between flights is, that's just... For people like us, that becomes odd. That's like our de facto, our default operating me mechanism. And we hear a lot these days that sitting is the new smoking. And one thing that's always perplexed me is why people rush onto the plane to sit down for longer. I'm usually the last one on the plane. I never have a problem with finding a, a spot for my luggage. And then I'm also seated the, the, the shortest out of most of the people on the plane. <laughs> Well, and that's but that that's one way to do it. I I have to I have to admit I am one of those people that gets a little antsy having I mean, the first boarding <laughs> group. But but I will say that's because I try to I don't check my bags. I have a roll on. I have a backpack. I want to get my roll on the overhead bin. I want to sit down, get sorted out, and then also then what I do as soon as I'm in my seat, it's kind of like ah, I relax a little bit. I pull out a newspaper. I you know check mm. check my phone maybe for the last time for the next number of hours. And I have to, I have to admit, I, I have learned over the years, I can be very productive on airplanes. In fact, I wrote most of my first book, Smarter Workouts, while flying on airplanes. Just you get good at doing that, right? If you travel often enough, and I've, I've fortunately been very lucky to have a job that's allowed me to travel. And so I got good. And, and there's sometimes like I can write a blog post or two on a flight. And so while I'm in the air, I'm making money writing blogs for clients. And that's just, I've learned how to be productive that way. Yeah, if you know in advance, you can do all the research up front. So when it comes yeah. time, you can just sit down and do the work without needing like external resources that you can't access while you're flying. And, and no, the my favorite thing, the reason why I can get that done in, in like a two-hour flight or a three-hour flight is no emails are coming in that they're distracting yes. me. Nothing, but I'm serious. Like no emails are popping up, no tweets are popping. You, know, you don't have those stupid notifications going off that will go off when you're trying to get some dedicated. You know, if you're at your desk at, at home or wherever you are you get those like little distractions. And I don't know about you, but I, can, I find I'm, I'm so thankful 
that we finally have coffee shops back open. And I think that my public library is back open because I actually like working at a coffee shop or at the library because I find that if I'm around other people, I'm a little more focused. Whereas if I'm at home, I, it's easy to lose. It's easy to lose focus. I'll pet my dog for a little bit instead of doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So you mentioned that you like to travel with just a carry on and I do the same thing. I have a 40 liter carry on backpack as big as TSA allows. And I pack in, I optimize what I pack. I minimize the supplements just to the core essentials. But since you are a personal trainer and a fitness expert, what do you bring for your fitness in that little carry on? Well, it depends on where I'm going. And, and now for listeners, most of the time when I travel, a good, a strong majority of the time, I'm traveling in my role as an educator for core health and fitness. So I'm usually traveling to a fitness event or I'm traveling to a place where I'm going to be, I know I'm going to be at a health club. So that that's where I'm not as worried. So I know if I'm going to be going to a conference, usually the conference hotel, usually my fitness conferences, the hotel organizers usually do a good job of picking out hotels mm the hotel, the conference organizers pick out hotels that have fitness centers in them. And I do scope out, I go online and say, okay, what, I try to find out what type of equipment, if any, they might have. And then the only thing I'll bring with me, and I happen to have it right here, sitting right here. The only thing I might bring with me is I might bring one of these like one meter super bands and like a mini band, um, because those are just easy to put in there. And I've found that even just in a hotel room, you can really just loop it over your shoulders for some squats hook it off to the doorknob for some one arm rows. And look, when you travel, you always have, there, there are three types of training loads, right? When you read uh, Bill Kramer and uh, Vladimir Zatsyorsky's book, there are three types of loads. There's stimulating loads, there's maintenance loads, and there's detraining loads. Okay. So when I travel, I always think of like, I'm trying to maintain. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to do something, primarily body weight or primarily elastic resistance. I'm on the road sometimes as short as two days, Sometimes if I'm doing an Asia trip, I might be gone for two weeks. I just plan on, I, I, and also the other thing I do too, is, is you know about periodization, is I'll super, I'll push myself for about a week before. Like say I know I'm doing a 10 day trip and I know my fitness might be intermittent during that trip. Well, for the 10 days to two weeks prior to that trip, I'm going to go hard. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go really hard because I know I'm going to push it to what's called overreaching, functional overreaching. So that way, when I'm going to the, going on the trip, it's actually a chance for me to kind of like, okay, I can kind of deload a little bit and I don't need to worry about that. And actually it feels good to not train for two or three days to, you know, while I might be changing time zones or might be going somewhere else. So those are all like little tricks. And normally like in normal life, unless, unless I'm training for something specific, I don't push the functional overreach, but I know if I know I'm not going to have access to fitness equipment or be able to work out on my normal pattern for for a few days i will do it to push to push it i also do the same thing before i go on vacation that way i kind of earn my beach time <laughs> <laughs> but key to that key to functional overreaching is making it just overreaching and you do that by recovering if you're not sleeping you're staying up late you're drinking all that's going to impair your recovery and it's going to cause that overreaching to, to be a a distress, a negative stress, and cause more problems than you are getting benefits out of it. Well, that's just it. And then that way, if even if I'm traveling across time zones, I don't feel bad for not working out for the first two or three days because between the overreach, between everything else, I know my body's kind of resetting itself. And therefore, I'm not, you know, it's like, hey, I've had the, I've had the additional stress of exercise. I've had the stress of now I'm on 10, 12 time zones away. And, and so therefore it just kind of, I've, I've just learned how to exercise all about managing stress. Right. And so it's a way that I look at that. And then once I get acclimated to wherever I am and, and I do a lot of work in Asia, I have a Chinese work visa. Somehow I ended up with a, a work visa for China a few years ago. So I go over there during normal times. I'm over in China about once a quarter for a few days at a time. But one of my favorite, one of my favorite hacks, and this is for listeners, say you're staying in the top floor of a, of a hotel or in a tall hotel if I'm on the 20th floor, I might get off of the 10th or 12th floor and walk the rest of the way up. I'm not going to walk up all 20 flights because <laughs> <laughs> they're usually not the, 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 the stair shafts are not, are not air conditioned, which can be a big deal in Shanghai in the summer. But I, I walk up like if it's the end of the day and I know I haven't done much exercise, 
And I know that now I got to go out to dinner with my clients or go out to dinner with the distributor that I'm working with. Then I at least know, hey, I'm going to get, I'm going to walk up eight to 10 flights of stairs, yes. take me 20, 24 minutes. I'm usually sweating before I go hop in the shower. And the way I look at this, Nick, something's better than nothing. So doing, doing 10 to 12 floors of stair climbing is better than nothing if, if I don't have a chance to hit the gym for the day. I actually considered for my health, first health optimization website, getting the domain name, takethestairs.com, because I firmly believe that if we were to get rid of elevators for normal use, and if everyone was to take the stairs instead, there would be huge health boosts around the country or world. Well, it's funny because traveling, you, you can tell, you can tell who like the fit people are because you have everybody we standing and for listeners, I'm, I'm turning to the side. You people are standing on the stage on the, on the escalator and you see those of us will put the roll on, on our shoulder and we'll walk <laughs> up the stairs, like going from the B concourse to the C concourse at yeah. O'Hare is a perfect example. Cause you'll see the fit people have their backpack or have their, their, their roll on, on their shoulder and they're taking the stairs. I have short legs, so I'm taking them one stairs at a time. But usually you'll see the, the super, the taller guys taking them every other stair. And you kind of give each other a little smile and a nod <laughs> because you know you're doing, you're, you're getting your extra steps in. And you see all the people on the, on the escalator just kind of looking at you because yep. you're keeping the same pace they are, but you're getting a little workout while they're standing still. I love that. That's like one of the little joys of travel. I hadn't thought about <laughs> that in a while. That's like one of the little joys of travel is when you're walking upstairs and somebody's looking at you while they're standing on the escalator and you know they're thinking, shoot, I should be doing the same thing. Especially when the escalator is slower than you're walking. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and then you get to the gate and then you stand there for 20 minutes. Hey, it, you know, whatever. I mean, but the, but but in all seriousness, these are all things that we can do because the way I look at it with my clients over the years, travel is usually the most intrusive thing that's going to happen in our lives because it takes us out of our normal routine, whether it's for 24 hours or whether it's for seven days. And we have to learn how to adjust and work around it. Mm hmm. So I, I guess this is a good point to, since your podcast is called All About Fitness, let's define that word. What is fitness to you? Fitness, I love that. Thank you. Um, to me, if you look up any, if you look up in a de the definition of fitness in the dictionary, it does not mention appearance. It does not talk about six pack abs. It doesn't talk about booty, which you know a lot of people seem to think that's what working out leads to. But what fitness does mean is work capacity, is ability is performance. And so Nick, the way I like to look at fitness and define fitness is, is fitness is having the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And, and for those people who they, they might be doing a set of competitions like bodybuilding or bikini or figure or whatever you want to call it, if they want to walk on a stage in their underwear, well, that's fitness because that's what their goal is. And that's what they're training for. You might have somebody else who bad back injury, the bad back pain, maybe they got in a bad car accident. I was just talking with an older friend earlier today who has a neurological issue going on and his doctor told him he can't ride his bike anymore. And this guy, he's in his early seventies and he loves to ride his bike, but the doctor said, you know what, this is going on with your nervous system. You're taking your, 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 you're risking your life, not just your health, but if you fall while you're on your bike, which could happen because of your balance issues. Yeah. And, and so for him, fitness, fitness was staying on his bike. We were talking about this just before we hopped on the call, which is why I'm at the top of mind. He now has to redefine what fitness means for him. Mm -hmm. You know, for him being in his seventies, fitness was the ability to go out and do a 30 mile bike ride. Now he's having to recalculate that and readjust that and, and determine a new, what, what a new, a new definition of fitness is. But for, for whoever's listening out there, fitness is about the ability to go out and just enjoy life about the ability to go out and do what you want to do. And, and, and who cares what you look like? Just go out and enjoy life. I mean, to me, that's what fitness is about. But a side effect of prioritizing your fitness is that it often coincides with looking good as well, if you do it right. Form follows function, yes. right? Because when you look at top athletes, and I always point this out to people when I do lectures, is when you look at top athletes, for the most part, top athletes, unless they have like a, a sick like modeling contract, outside their sport, top athletes are training to be, to be as, as effective and as efficient as they can on the field, on the pitch, on the court, wherever they're playing. Well, if they're training at an elite level to be, to be the best competitor they can be, their body is going to follow the, the way they train. And so what, if they're eating right, if they're sleeping right, if they're doing all the things right, 
they're going to get these incredible physiques. But the function comes first, their performance comes first, and the appearance follows. And I look at it the same way where is if I'm trying to be fit so I can mountain bike, play with my kids, enjoy the occasional swim at the beach, you know, that's I, out of that, I should have a relatively healthy and fit body. So what's your background? How did you get into fitness? I kind of did it backwards where I was in management first, but I wanted to learn, I wanted to kind of learn more about personal training and more about the business. So I figured getting paid to be a manager for a while was the best way to do that. Then starting the year 2000, I became a full-time personal trainer instructor and did that for six years. And in that time, I earned my master's degree. And in 2006, I got hired to be a director of education for the now defunct Sports Club LA. They got bought out by Equinox a few years ago Mm -hmm. from there. And so it's so funny, Nick, goal setting is so important. I remember in 2005, when I was starting my master's program, I wrote, get master's degree, become director of education, go to work for a certification. And that's exactly what I did. I became the director of education for a couple of years. In 2008, I moved out to San Diego where I worked for the American Council on Exercise. And they're one of the big personal training certifications. So within a couple of years of getting my master's degree, and I, I say I, I got certified in 1998. And in 2008, I went to work for one of the certifications. And so since then, since 2008, I've been doing predominantly education. I still train a little bit, still have a couple of clients, still teach a couple of group fitness classes, but predominantly I write education content. And like right now, I still work for ACE as a contractor. Mm. I work for NASM, the National Academy of Sports Medicine, as a contractor. I work for Nautilus and Stairmaster, as I mentioned, and I, I've written a couple of books and I, I do my podcast. So what, what I found, and this is a long story and I apologize about that, but what I found is that explaining exercise comes relatively easy to me. And so I enjoy sharing that with others. And I look at this as my mission is helping other people learn how to use exercise to enhance their quality of life. And as, again, that, that leave that open-ended. You get to decide what that means for you, but I want to help you learn how to use exercise so you can live a little bit better lifestyle. So let's break that down then. What does that quality of life look like? look like for you and then how are you how have you designed your like fitness program and routine around that in all reality quality of life means just that can i get up can i go take a walk can i play with my kids i had kids relatively late we didn't have kids till i was 40 so my kids are still in elementary school and can i hang out with my kids and keep up with them in a swimming pool can i hop on my mountain bike which i'm going to do after this call go out for the probably about seven, eight mile mountain bike ride just nice. down the street for me. Can I, can I do that stuff? And that, that is what I try to do for the quality of life. And so in order to do that, I alternate my workouts between strength training, like functional movement and cardiorespiratory or metabolic conditioning. Those are all great. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but Dr. Peter Atia has a concept that he calls the centenarian Olympics that he's training for. And so if you were to imagine at age a hundred all the activities you want to be able to do, you reverse engineer your workout routine so that you're able to do those no matter what age you are. Well, honestly, I have not, I hadn't heard, I'm going to have to look that up, dude, because no joke. I, I say this all the time. I am on a 20 something year macro cycle to be the fastest white guy in my (laughs) seventies. I've never been a fast sprinter, but I still try to sprint not quite once a week, but I try to get out and do some field work like agility training plyometric training, skipping, sprinting at least three, two, three times a month, because, Hey, if I just maintain my speed, when I'm in my seventies, I'm going to rock it, but I've never been a fast guy before. But, but that, that's one thing I look at is I look at, at exercise as the means for managing the aging process. So now when in my forties, I train so I can be active in my forties. I'm not training for some media fed aesthetic appearance, I'm training so that if somebody invites me to go out for a mountain bike ride, I can say yes. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to go for a hike, I can say yes. If somebody wants to go stand up paddle boarding, I can say yes. I have choices based on my fitness level for what I can do. Now, if somebody had back pain, if somebody wasn't that fit and they got asked to go out on a hike, they'd have to say, well, I don't know about that. And then your life becomes relatively narrow and, and that's just not an option for me. Or make excuses, which is even worse. Yeah, no, exactly. Make, make excuses. And, and no, I, I, I like getting out there and just, I like trying to push myself and, and to share this story when I was a young man right out of college and I returned to Washington DC, 
we had talked about this a little bit because you said you played a little bit of rugby when you're uh, at Claremont. And I was looking for something to do. I was like, I had spent my semester abroad in London. I'd watched a lot of rugby on TV. And I looked up a local rugby club in the Washington, D.C. area. Well, I didn't know that they're one of the elite rugby clubs at the time in, in the States. I, I show up for training. And, and Nick, I was blown away. I was 22 years old. I was strong because I'd played some college, some football in college, but I wasn't that fit. These guys showed me what fitness meant. But not only got that, there were guys in their 30s and early 40s, men in their 30s and early 40s, who were running around and just beating the piss out of each other and then patting each other on the back and going to the bar on a Thursday or Saturday after the match. And, and that got me – at that time, I was 22 years old. I saw guys that were 15, 20 years older than me, and I just a, a switch turned on in my head and said, I want to be like them when I'm their age. I want to be that fit when I'm their age. And now I, I, I train. You ask one of the reasons why I train. One of the ways I train is so I can go out and play um, play old boys tournament rugby a couple times a year and go play old boys is like 20 minute halves. You, you get free substitutions. So that's my goal is to be able to play. I've played rugby all the way through from my 20s to my 40s, and I'm going to give it a go in my 50s. And I'm going to worry about my 60s when I get to my 60s. <laughs> but I've been in old boys rugby tournaments. I've been to old boys rugby tournaments when guys are guys are in their late fifties and early sixties, they're playing in the over 45 or the over 55 division, but they're still playing rugby because there's such an ethos of, of just comp competition and fitness in that culture that it really is hard to get away from. And it keeps you in shape, the social gamification of fitness and health and having that accountability of your peers checking in on you, or I guess competing with you in rugby in the scrum in the lineouts. if you know rugby these are all different yeah. parts of the game but I just, just having that support there is an extra reason well even just go out and play in touch um here in san diego and, and for people or listeners if you're ever in san diego there's a, there, there are two great games i've only been to one of them but they're on the beach in del mar one is sunday morning and one is wednesday evening and it's a lot of older guys a lot of south africans a lot of australians but you can run touch on the beach and, and, and you're, you're, the fellows will let you know if you're not fit to be out there playing touch. <laughs> Anybody's welcome. Anybody's more than welcome. You're playing barefoot on the, on the, you're playing barefoot on the sand, playing touch rugby. Um, but you see guys out there in their 50s and 60s, so they still want to go out there because when you're running ball in hand, I don't care how old you are, you feel like you're 24 and king of the world. <laughs> One of the things we've talked about in a previous conversation was high-intensity training or HIT training. You wrote a book called Ageless Intensity. Let's talk about some of the reasons that you became so interested in this form of training. Well, just as I'm explaining, I mean, I saw when I when I was in my early 20s and I, I, and I became a, a fitness professional, personal trainer at 26 years old, you learn the 220 minus your age, right, for the max heart rate. Mm -hmm. And even if you take the Carvonin formula, which takes into account your resting heart rate, I was telling people in these spinning classes, Nick, in these indoor cycling classes, I was telling people, I was telling old people, I'm using air quotes, I was telling old people in their late 40s and early 50s, and I'm laughing because that's my age now, but I was 26 years old telling people who are 50 years old, hey, you shouldn't go above this, this is your max heart rate, and they're looking at me going, I barely feel like I'm breaking a sweat. Yes. You know, they, they, I was right when polar heart rate monitors were coming out, and the gym I worked at, we had polar heart rate monitors for people to borrow during cycling class. And I said, well, at your age, never say that to somebody, but when I said at your age, based on this, this is what this is where you should be to get a good one. And they're looking at me like going 140 beats a minute. I barely feel like I'm working. <laughs> and, and so it was it, it was that many years ago between that and, and seeing these guys in their 30s and 40s playing rugby at a high level. And then you read this stuff about exercise for older adults. And they're like, yeah, well, do chair exercise or older adults shouldn't lift heavy weights or there are all these rules. And, and it's something that really offended me a few years ago um, was put out by a group of chiropractors about if you're over the age of 50, you shouldn't do squats. If you're over the age of 50, you shouldn't do jumps. It was all this nonsense. And it's like, no, I mean, if you're over the age of 50, you don't start there. But if you're in yeah. your 50s and you've been working out for 35, 40 years, by all means, pick up something heavy. And what I realized what I realized a number of years ago is, is that the fitness industry started in about 1970, a little bit, maybe a little couple of years earlier than that, but about 1970, that's when Nautilus, when Arthur Jones created Nautilus strength machines. So at about that time, maybe a couple of years before or after, that's when commercial health clubs 
became kind of a viable, there became a viable business model of commercial health clubs. And all the strength training machines made strength training more accessible and easier to do than trying to learn how to do barbell lifts. So it allowed greater access. At the same time, you had Judy Shepard Massette create Jazzercise, which was kind of like dance aerobics yeah. or dance classes for people who didn't actually want to become dancers. And then you had the Cooper Clinic start talking about the benefits of aerobic exercise. So all those things happened, you know, Jazzercise, Nautilus, Health Clubs, the Cooper Clinic, all that happened between about the late 1960s and the mid 1970s. And then all of a sudden, fitness became, became a popular pastime, right? We never before the 1970s, Nick, and this will blow people's minds, we did not do exercise as a recreational pastime. If you look back in the 50s and the 40s, going back you know, years, even in the, in the 19 teens and in the 1890s, when you had the era of, era of physical culture, those were more outliers. Exercise was not really part of the physical pastime or, or our recreational pastime until, until the 1970s. But if, if, you were, if you're in your early 20s, if you were born in 1950, if you're part of the baby boom generation and you were born around 1950, give or take, and you started working out in a health club in your mid 20s in the 1970s, and you're still a member of a health club now, and you've been working out for 40 or 45 years, there's no information for you. Yeah. You're fit. You can move relatively well. You're strong. You're healthy. You want to work out hard, but you just want to do it the right way. And if you look at most of the literature, most of the literature would say, oh, no, if you're over 50, don't lift anything heavy. If you're over 60, don't do high-intensity interval training. Well, there have been some studies. There have been more studies in the last four or five years looking at, at high-intensity interval training to an older adult population, primarily sedentary, primarily people who don't exercise. And what they're finding is High intensity exercise still provides benefits for people in their 60s and 70s, but those are for un, for unconditioned or deconditioned sedentary individuals. So let's extrapolate that and look at people who are fit and who've been exercising their whole life. They should be doing. Doesn't mean you do it every day by any stretch of your imagination, yeah. but at least two or three workouts a week if you're over the age of 50 should have you huffing and puffing pretty hard. The other days of the week you should be sweating but not really losing your breath. And that's really what I want people to understand is that as you get older, you have to be a little bit smarter with how you train, but you should still train as hard as your body allows you to. And if your body says, hey, you know what? Today's not a day you lift heavy weights. Well, go out for a long walk. Do, do something else, get your heart rate up. But just there's no reason age should not dictate how we exercise. Yeah, and high intensity training has benefits, I guess, for all age ranges. You just have to take a different approach depending on which decade you're in in life? Well, one of the biggest benefits, I mean, you're, you're right about that. And one of the biggest benefits is the production of anabolic hormones. And, and anabolic just means growth, just means you're growing. Catabolic means you're breaking down. So if you're, if you're a male, like in your 40s, like I am, one of the biggest issues is something called andropause. Your body will produce less testosterone as you age. But if you do strength training, high-intensity strength training, meaning lifting to a point of fatigue, and if you do high intensity interval training, the research shows that even if you're in your 60s and 70s, your body will still produce levels of testosterone at the same ratio as younger men, 30, 40 years younger than you. And for women, good news for women out there, the research shows that women in their 50s and 60s who either do strength training or high intensity interval training, women produce more growth hormone. Growth hormone helps metabolize fat more efficiently. But growth hormone also, it also supports collagen production, and collagen is a, is a protein that's a large component of skin. So for women out there in your 40s and 50s, if you're not strength training, you should be doing that. You're not going to break out of muscle overnight. You don't have testes. Testosterone is made primarily in the testes, which is why men develop muscle easier than women. But for women who strength train, I know so many women who started strength training in their mid-40s and they love their bodies now, and they don't have to spend an hour a day on a treadmill. You know, and I've, I've known women that have said, you know what, I don't even do cardio anymore. I do strength training and yoga. And they're like, I finally have the body, or they do bar classes, which is just a, another version of strength training. But they say they finally have that. I've heard from a number of women, I finally have the body I want and feel comfortable with. And it's thanks to strength training instead of endless hours on a, on a piece of cardio equipment. For full disclosure, I wrote one of my early blog posts on the reasons I don't like running or I guess any long, steady state, moderate intensity exercise. One of the big ones you just mentioned was the hormonal response. 
from the long steady state moderate intensity exercise you increase the catabolic hormones the cortisol the epinephrine the things that are breaking your body down and you do not get the same anabolic response so you don't build your body back up you just d degrade it and you then you layer on top modern stresses and it becomes like a negative detractor from your health versus strength training hit training all these other forms of like really short high intensity exercise they mitigate the spike of stress hormones with powerful anabolic hormone response that are stronger and have a net positive growth and rebuilding effect you're so right about that nick and i really for 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 listeners if you listen to nick's podcast regularly he's on the money with that and because when you look at and the one thing i'll challenge people is if you ever smell if you do like if you do a long workout and maybe you take your shirt, you put it in the plastic bag from the gym and you leave it in your gym bag a day too long. You don't put it in the, in the laundry right away. And we've all done that. And you smell your shirt and it smells like ammonia. Nitrogen is a component of ammonia. Nitrogen are, is also a component of amino acids. Amino acids are protein. When your sweat smells like ammonia, that means you're metabolizing amino acids or protein for fuel, not carbohydrate and not fats. And that's really where I think, you know, and you can play that little chemistry, that at home chemistry, and you're much, people are much better off doing eight to 12 minutes of high intensity interval training for their workout. That's all they need to do. All the research suggests that with HIT training is the intensity, not the duration. That's the key factor. And there, there are a number of studies I've seen that have shown the smaller, the shorter time intervals of higher intensity exercise produce better results than running for 30 or 60 minutes at a steady state pace on a treadmill. And, and just for listeners, that's why I choose mountain biking as my primary form of, of cardiorespiratory conditioning is because mountain biking, I might be grinding uphill for eight to 12 minutes, but at some point, it's not too long. I'm going to turn back down and go downhill. Well, I'm not doing that much work. <laughs> the only work I'm doing is, is with my brake with my brake hands and, and working on reactivity. But I look at mountain biking as like the perfect interval training. And, and as I get older, as, as I age, I love trail running, but my knees, I have, I have pretty gnarly arthritis in my right knee. So it sometimes it doesn't like me trail running, but I go out and try to do as much hiking as possible because it just feels, I don't know, just there's something about being outside and, and just yeah. being, in, you know, being on a good, I don't, have you felt that way at all? I mean, have you noticed that? I mean, I know you're in the city, but. Yeah. I mean, I'm leaving New York city for that very reason. I need to be outdoors. And when I train outdoors, I feel better. And one thing that I love doing when I'm going on a nice mountain bike ride is to, I guess, punctuate it. So I'll go at a moderate pace up the hill. Then I'll decide to go all out for 10, 15 seconds and then coast. And by coast, I mean, just ease up the intensity, continuing to go up the hill and a couple rounds of that can absolutely gas you. Well, and, 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 the, and, the, and the routes I take, like I know like today's going to be an easy ride, for example, and they're going to be two, they're going to be two pretty good grinds I do, but they're relatively short. And that always, how I take those hills lets me know how my fitness level is doing. And I'm still coming back. I, I sprained my wrist about five weeks ago in one of those old boy rugby tournaments. So I'm still, I'm just, I'm just, I don't, I don't trust my wrist yet to be going crazy downhill. So I'm really staying on the flat parts and not going up the, um, the really steep parts because if you go up the steep hills, what do you have to do? You have to turn around and come down them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm keeping it relatively flat. Um, but you're right. The one thing that's great about mountain biking is that you can just be consistent and you can grind for a little bit, really get that heart rate up. And then sometimes when you do need to stop and take a breath, you stop and take a look around and you're somewhere pretty dang gorgeous. And that to me is like, I love, I love stopping on the trail, looking around and going, I have the ability to be here. Yes. I have the ability to be out in this environment right now and be somewhere so beautiful. And I just, I take a moment to say thanks and just really appreciate that. And one other thing is that for endurance athletes, whether you're a runner, a cyclist, a rower, it's even more important to do some form of strength training because your body needs that to rebuild, rebuild from all the chronic endurance and cardio. Yeah, especially in the off season, man. I mean, you, 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 you're so right. I mean, here in North County, San Diego, I, I teach uh, part time at a YMCA, and I like the YMCA community. It's a, it's a, they're good. They're, it's a good community. My kids take classes there, and as an instructor, they get pretty gnarly discount, which is why I teach there. 
but I have so many runners and triathletes that come to the classes I teach. And I always try to get them thinking about it. I'm like, okay, are you training for a competition? Then right now you should be only doing your maintenance runs. Don't, you don't need to go out and grind, do your maintenance runs, do your, do your speed work. Don't worry about doing anything more than five. If you're not training for a marathon or training for like a half iron, there's no need to run more than seven or 10 miles. In my opinion, mm-hmm. you know, for, for an endurance athlete, if it takes you longer than an hour, hour and a half, you shouldn't run it. If you can run seven miles in an hour, that's a pretty good pace. Do it. But if you should, unless you're training for a competition, there's no need to really go out for the long grind, grinding runs in the off season. And some of the research I've seen shows that the optimal duration for anabolic hormone response is 30 to 45 minutes. So it's actually a very short session. So sometimes when I want to get a longer workout in a day, a more intense workout, a harder workout, I'll have a morning session of 30, 45 minutes, I'll refuel, and then I'll have a late afternoon, early evening session. No, I've seen a lot of the same. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the same stuff about where shorter is better, right? Is shorter, higher intensity is better? Because I hear sometimes people like, oh, I was at the gym for 90 minutes for two hours. And, and I probably we probably looked at some of the same literature because anything what I've read, anything longer than like 50 minutes, you, your, your anabolic response will start dropping unless you start, you know, start taking carbohydrate and protein or some, you know, branched chain amino acids. So I really I look at that. I try I like it as a challenge. Like, can I get a good workout? in 30 Mm -hmm. or 40 minutes and and get it pumping one heuristic i like to use to decide what type of exercise to do is i think about the two concepts of duration and intensity and the shorter the duration the higher the intensity for the same beneficial response And, and on the opposite end if you want a long duration the intensity has to be much lower because otherwise you're taxing the body too much yeah, and, and there's sometimes, man, where I haven't had much time. And in my apartment complex, it's not really, it's not a great fitness room, but there, there's a TRX in there, there's a cable machine, and they have a, a 24 kg kettlebell. It's not my favorite kind of kettlebell, but they, it's a 24 kg kettlebell. I don't have to carry around anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, literally, if I don't have much time, I'll go in there and do like an AMRAP of like I do TRX rows, push ups, kettlebell swings, and cable chops. And just, I'll try to get five or six rounds of that in 20, 24 minutes. And I have to tell you, you're sweating buckets and, you know, am I pushing, am I going to be pushing max strength? No, but between either swings or swing snatches, doing the rows, doing push-ups, and doing the cable chops, I mean, that's, so that's, in my opinion, you know, hey, for trying to maintain fitness and maintain just ability, mobility, that's, that's all we really need. What are some of the other, like, I guess, cognitive or just the full mind body benefits of high intensity exercise i love that question man that is because so a lot of people have this image of the dumb jock right of the dumb weightlifter but in reality there's a lot of cool research on something called bdnf that's brain derived neurotrophic factor and and i'm sure you've probably covered that with your listeners before and bdnf um as the as i interviewed um who did I interview? Now I'm going to have a little uh, mind for John Medina. Dr. John Medina mm. wrote the, the book, Brain Rules for Aging Well, and he calls BDNF miracle growth for the brain because yep. BDNF helps promote, promote the growth of new brain cells. And v, there's something called VGEF, and I forget exactly what it stands for, but VGEF helps promote the growth of new um, blood vessels in the brain. So BDNF is a neurotrophic factor. It's a protein that helps promote the growth of cells. VGEF helps promote the growth of vessels in the brain. High intensity exercise has been shown in study after study that high intensity exercise is more effective for elevating BDNF than even moderate intensity exercise. So there is a cognitive component in that sense, but also too, you know, if you look at it, Nick, motor skill development is cognitive training. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody that hasn't swung a kettlebell before, the act of, it, it might take you weeks or might take you a few months to really dial in and groove the pattern, but that act, you're learning new movement patterns, you're programming. I look, I try to describe the human body this way. The human body is kind of like a cell phone. Your muscles and your skeletal structures are the hardware. On the cell phone, the hardware is the glass, the metal, and a little bit of plastic, right? Well, what makes the glass, the metal, and the plastic work? It's the operating system. Mm-hmm. So in the human body, the operating system is a nervous system, right? So the operating system coordinates everything in our body. 
the default, the default operating system in the body is the gait pattern. We crawl, we spend about 12 to 14 months of our, of our life learning how to go from rolling to crawling to walking. So we know how to use that movement pattern. Anytime you teach and you learn a new exercise, you're downloading a new app, you're downloading new software into your hardware. So whether you're learning a kettlebell, whether you're learning a TRX, whether you're learning a barbell, what you're doing is you're taking your, your hardware, you're taking that operating system and you're uploading new software to it to teach you how to move more efficiently. And that's, you know, I love explaining that to when I teach courses to personal trainers, to new personal trainers, I'm like, look, how many of your parents give you a hard time about working in a gym? Because I know my mother did. <laughs> my mother's like, when are you, you going to get a real job? When I left politics years and years ago to work in a gym, she kept asking, when do you get a real job? Well, I tell people, consider yourself a computer programmer for the human body. Because mm. when you teach a client a new exercise, you're essentially giving them a new program. You're, you're downloading new software. You're downloading a new app so they can use their hardware more efficiently. And, you know, for some of us, it might take us a few hours to learn something new. For others, it might take weeks. And that's really where one of the other benefits, cognitive benefits for exercise, is to try something new. Like I was, I was getting back into yoga before everything got shut down last year due to COVID. And as soon as my wrist is, is 100% and I can put weight on it again, I plan on getting back to doing one or two yoga classes a week because number one, I suck at yoga. <laughs> and it just, but number two, I like the way my body feels. When I focus on moving, when I focus on breathing, when I slow down and do more of a parasympathetic exercise workout like yoga, the other thing I'm starting to do right now is swimming is my, my, young, my older daughter is trying out for junior lifeguards and she has to be able to swim 100 meters in a certain time and tread water for three minutes. So I was practicing with her and I was like, wait, I suck. I haven't swam in a long time. And so I've been, you know, I, I still stink, but for the last few weeks, I've been getting in the pool two or three times a week. And, you know, I hated swim team when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, but I'm looking at it now. I'm getting back to those motor patterns. I'm getting back to motor patterns I haven't used for 30 something years. And that to me, the, the mental stimulation of that is just as important to rewire my body to work differently than it is the, the cardiorespiratory and the strength benefit from swimming. And you're also rewiring your body to be able to operate efficiently in different circumstances. That's it, man. I mean, I live, I live a couple miles from the ocean. And one of the reasons why I haven't gone in the beach that I've gone in the ocean that much is I know that my swimming is kind of weak. So now that my daughters are getting older, now that my daughters are becoming better swimmers, I'm like, I better, now's the time to get off, get off my duff. And I'm actually, that's the other reason. Now I just got hired again at the YMCA and I've been looking at taking some swim, uh, some getting some swim um, uh, lessons at the Y just so, cause I want to be able to, I want to be able to go to the beach with my daughters and yes, yes. there are lifeguards at the beach, but I, A, I want to be able to swim with them and B, if anything happens, I want to be able to at least do my best to be, to be a resource to them instead of standing on the beach going, Oh shit, I can't do any, yeah. sorry, but I say, Oh no, I can't do anything. <laughs> um, and you know, cause I haven't been anyway, I just want to, I know now that my daughter's getting older and going to be wanting to go to the beach more with their friends and everything. I got to be a stronger swimmer for them. Mm -hmm. This year in 2021, I started, I realized that my training program has been pretty stagnant over the last seven, eight years. And I guess the variation consists of mostly changes of reps, sets, duration, and occasionally I'll switch from barbell to dumbbell or kettlebell. But aside from that, not much change. And because of that, not much neurological progress. So I've realized through, I took a, a course called Integrated Movement Science by Paul Check and became a Czech level one practitioner. And a core theme there is to vary your workouts in different ways. And so this year I've been focusing on unstable surface training and taking things that I can do, say a barbell bench and using a Swiss ball or kneeling on this or putting one foot up. And all of a sudden I'm getting sore in ways I haven't been sore. And when I go back to the core lifts that I used to do after doing the unstable surface training for a while, I'm stronger. I also can see the different muscular development that I'm not used to. So there is something to changing up, not just the exercise, but the way you perform the exercise. And that's so right, man. And two, like, again, it comes down to getting a little bit older, right? And I kind of look at this as 
where I used to go when I lived in, in Washington, DC, I lived on top of Rock Creek Park. And two or three times a week during the summer, I would go out and trail run through Rock Creek Park, maybe three to three or four miles at a time. But you're going up and down some pretty pretty cool rocky stuff being right in the middle of the city. And I used to lift, you know, heavy weight, swing heavy kettlebells. Now that I'm getting a little bit older, it's like, okay, let me do a little more swimming. Let me try to do a little more yoga of where I'm using my body, just as you said, Nick, and that's exactly why I'm trying to do this, is I want to use my body differently because I, I still want to be able to lift heavy weights but I recognize now I should maybe do two or three heavy cycles a year instead of I was before kind of trying to stay heavy throughout the year. But now I'm looking at, at, at my years like, okay, when am I going to do, you know, when am I going to do heavy cycles? When am I going to do more mobility, more just kind of get out and move stuff. And I'm kind of looking at, at training that way of where now when, when winter time comes, I'm not going to be outside as much. I'll probably be lifting heavier. But now that it's summertime, I, there's a lot more chances to be outside I'll be on my bike more, go hiking more, try to do more swimming and just use my body differently. And part of it is just so I'm not overstimulating myself. And so I do try to, because I have to tell you, man, the first time I got back in the pool about three or four weeks ago, I, dude, I felt like I was going to, I, you know, I just was floundering, man. It stunk. <laughs> and I was swimming yesterday. I was, I was doing some laughs with my daughter yesterday. And I'm like, okay, I'm still, I, I, I still have a lot of room to, to improve, but I felt my, feel myself getting better. Is, is is so and that you know why else will we train we train so we can get you know is that that kaizen of one percent you know that one percent that con continual change and i can feel myself getting a little bit better each time mm -hmm. and also there's a lot of processes in the body and in general the body responds really well to variation for example there's the enzymes in our microbiome change they fluctuate with the seasons so you might tolerate bread really well in the fall hmm. when the enzymes are naturally the highest but not in the winter and i think the same thing applies to training so if if you're going to be out doing a lot of like summertime activities outside when the environment is conducive to it then probably when in the winter when the days are shorter you're more locked indoors from snowstorms and things that's probably a good time to spend more time doing strength training and focusing on building that versus the activities that you can't do. I, you're hitting on something that that's been kind of like, I, I, I wrote, I wrote an article recently for the American council on exercise on metabolic hormones and got, I touched a little bit on circadian rhythms, mm -hmm. right? And the circadian rhythms are how our body responds to light and dark. And I met this woman about maybe two months ago, two or three months ago, happened to meet her on, um, on one of the dating websites or whatever. But she's a uh, PhD. Uh, she's a molecular biologist down at uh, the Salk Institute at UCSD. Oh. And her work, dude, her work, she does fascinating work on circadian rhythms of cells, yeah. individual cells. And that was, so we had coffee and I'm like, hey, look, we might not work out in a dating thing. And I'm fine with that, but <laughs> you're cool. I'm like, I like talking to you because, yeah. I mean, we totally geeked out. I was asking her, she's done her, her, her study is on circadian rhythms of cells. Yeah. And they look at, they look at this individual cells, individual cells respond to light and dark. But not only that, they take it a step further. And how does that affect their ability to respond to drugs? to respond to anything introduced to the body. So I found, and she, I forget what she said about insulin and the circadian rhythms of insulin and, and um, the, the receptor, the receptor cells for that react with insulin. But it was just like, yeah. So when you, when you talk about that, I would believe that hundred percent that our body is very, I mean, look, we're elements of, we're elements of nature, right? I mean, we're, we're from, we're from nature yet, you know, here we are, we spend majority of our time in these artificial environments indoors so if we really took a step back, that's what I love about Paul's work. I mean, Paul has been leading the way on this for a number of years, going back to the late 90s and saying, hey, we got to get back to nature and really just get back to understanding how our body interacts with nature. Yeah, I interviewed Greg Potter, who is a circadian scientist on this show. And we talked all about the different Zeitgebers, as they're called in German, which are like the external environmental cues that signal to the body's many internal clocks as to what, what time it is and based on what time it is, different processes run. And light is a big one, uh, temperature is one, timing around, or meal timing is another. There's a bunch of different cues, but light is like the number one. Yeah, and that's that really is, that's one thing I've noticed. I've been trying to do a much better job at night of, um, 
I, I have blue glasses, blue light, blue light blockers. I need to wear them more. But what I've found that I've been doing for the last number of months is I'll turn off my TV around 9, 9.30 at night most nights, and that's when I'll listen to podcasts is I'll kind of like start down regulating that way as rather than having like a big light on there, I'll try to down, I'll try to turn the lights off and start listening to podcasts. And more often than not, I mean, I, and I don't, I don't, I listen to, and, and, and this is for listeners out there. I listen to historical podcasts of where they're talking about history and man, you want to talk about either that or economics podcast. You want to talk about going to sleep quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having somebody go through the go through the uh, there, there's uh, this one podcast on the Civil War. I think I think it might just be called Civil War, but the two uh, the the two hosts of it. Um, the, each episode is only about a half an hour long, and I don't think I've stayed awake for an entire episode. <laughs> I usually have to listen to them again. But the two uh, the two hosts um, really sound like NPR. They sound like NPR people because they're very soft and. They tell you what's going on and, and all of a sudden I'm like, I listen to that laying in bed and next thing you know, I wake <laughs> up and um, wake up and it's been like three or four hours since I've been asleep. But so that, that's one little hack I've done is, is I try to get away from from watching uh, too much TV and I try to shut down my screens um, no later than eight thirty nine o'clock and, and make and try to really because I've noticed a difference myself. That's that's one area of my fitness I've really been trying to improve upon is my sleep, both the quality and quantity of sleep because the more I read about it, there's the, the, the bigger difference it makes in our bodies. One other thing you can do there is if you get morning sunlight exposure, outdoors, not indoor artificial light, that partially inoculates you against the effects of some bright or blue light exposure at night. So huh. that's one thing if you don't have the glasses or it's just good in general to get outside for a few minutes, even just five minutes outside in the mornings. Well, that's a good thing about having a dog, right? Is a dog forces you uh, to get outside. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but it does. I mean, that's, that's what I, I, I love. And 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 honestly, like uh, we all have our routines, right? Most mornings of the week, I'm I'm getting my kids ready for school or for camp. I go over to their mother's house. She goes to work early. I go over there early to take care of them. And but then Saturday morning, my routine is I take my dog for a long walk around the neighborhood. And that's just like I love getting up and trying to get out. I don't say super early. I'm out by maybe eight, eight thirty at the latest. And go for a schlep, and I have an English bulldog, which is not a walker. So we do a little schlep. I call it a schlep. I'm telling you, I'm dragging my dog around the neighborhood. But <laughs> I, I, but there's something about it. I'm not a. I'm much more of a night owl than a, than a morning lark. I think they call it. Um, but I do love when you're up early in the morning. You do feel more productive. Mm-hmm. I was looking through your blog earlier, and I saw that you had a, a two different posts, a part one, part two on the best exercises depending on the decade you're in of life. What would you say your biggest findings were from that? Just the fact you need to keep exercising and the role that strength training plays. I mean, I, I really, I, I've written a couple articles on this over the years, which is what became the book Ageless Intensity. Um, but when, anytime they've done intervent- interventions on people in their 60s and 70s for strength training, people in their 70s still get stronger. People in their 70s will still grow muscle. Women will grow, will produce more growth hormone. Men will produce more testosterone. But even in, if you're in your 70s, and that's where, I, you know, for my dad, for example, my dad's 78. And I'm like, you know what? No more barbell, no more dumbbells. He's having some spatial issues. Go in the machines, push and pull on the levers of the machines. Anything younger than 70, I mean, even in your 60s, I, I'd much rather have people try to do free weights as long as they can. But once you get to a certain age, just using the resistance and working hard, because that's one of the things that keeps your tissues young. There's something called mechanotransduction, and I know you know what it is, Nick, but for listeners, mechanotransduction means that physical force creates chemical change in the body. So if you're using your muscles to generate force, you're stimulating chemical reaction, which builds new cells, new satellite cells, which become muscle tissue, and it produces the hormones, which help your body stay young. And that's really where... Um, strength training, I, in my opinion, is a fountain of youth. And you see it here in California, right? I mean, I see people in the gym who I think are in their 50s, and it turns out they're in their late 60s, early 70s. And you see people getting out of the you see people getting out of the you see people getting out of the water and they take their they they start taking their wetsuit off and they have all their chest hair is all gray. They might not have much hair on top anymore, but they're still good fit. They're still, and then they get in these really nice cars, and it's just but there's this whole, that's one of the reasons why I love living in, and yeah, I know you're from the area, right? You're from Southern California? Northern California. Well, okay, but you've, yeah, that's right. You spent time in Claremont. Yep. But I, when you're out West, you're just much more active 
and it just becomes a way of life than, than being back east where, you know, working becomes your primary driver. Out west, it seems like whatever your, whatever your activity is on the weekend, you do your job during the week so you can go out and have fun on the weekend. That, that really is. That's why Very I wanted true. to move out to California years ago, not only to work in fitness and the fitness industry, but the difference is when you're in D.C., New York and Boston, you, your job becomes your life. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you cross the Rockies and West, it's like, OK, your job is what your job. That's how you afford to be a surfer or skydiver or snowboarder or whatever it is, that you, whatever it is that gets you get you going. And to me, that's like, that's like the real secret of life. Find what you love and just do it as often as you can. That's actually exactly why I'm leaving New York, because I miss having that around me. And in the concrete jungle, there's not much here other than work and walking. Yeah, and, and, and people in New York, I mean, as much as I love New Yorkers and and I, I worked in and out of New York with New York companies for a few years, but people in New York, they're, they're, they're doing fitness because they want to look a certain way. They want to be a certain way out, out here. And you know, man, you're from Northern California. People do fitness because they want to go mountain biking on the weekend. They want to go snowboarding. They want to go to Mammoth. They want to go to Tahoe. They want to go to, you know, Big Sur. I mean, that, that's why people train out here. People train out here so they can get out and live life, not so they can go be the fastest one in their spin class, <laughs> whatever, whatever that gets you, <laughs> you know? So if listeners want to know, I guess, like a summary of your, your post, what are the, would you say the top three exercises are for each decade? You have to just generically come top, up with them. Top three exercises um, for each decade. I would kind of sum up as in your 20s, find out what you like in your 20s. Play around a little bit. Are you a group fitness person? Are you a workout person? What, find out what you like in your 20s and then you're, and start creating those habits. Because when you're in your 30s, what's going to happen in your 30s? Work is going to get more. You're going to get more responsibilities at work. In your 30s, that's when you probably, if you haven't had a family, that's when probably family life will start happening, when you'll start having kids or you'll start having to do kids' activities after work. And so if you take your time in your 20s to develop the habits, whether you go to yoga or cycling or strength training class or you get a trainer, the habits that you start in your 20s will carry on for the rest of your life. So when you're in your 30s, you should be doing strength training two or three times a week. You should be doing cardio training two or three times a week. And and understand, and I would say this for anybody in any age, there are going to be those weeks where you're not as busy, where you don't have as many uh, any things going on. You can train harder on those weeks because then there are those weeks when you got this and that and this report's due and you got this and that happens. Maybe you only get to the gym two or three times during those weeks. Well, it all balances out. If you train harder on those weeks when you aren't as busy at work, then on those weeks that you are busy, then you you have that balance. In my experience, that's been my my experience anyway. So 30s, strength training two or three times a week, cardio training two or three times a week. And if you aren't doing yoga when you're in your 30s, start trying to do yoga. That's when I started doing yoga. And I've been an intermittent yoga practitioner for about the past decade, a little bit more than the past decade. But when when I get into it, I enjoy it. Now that I'm in my 40s, I don't do as much heavy barbell, but I do a lot more TRX and kettlebell mm-hmm. and dumbbell work. And, and I still, you know, like I said, I struggle with getting yoga in there. And instead of like doing stuff, I, I can't stand running on a treadmill. If I'm going to spend 10 minutes on a treadmill, I'm walking the inclines. I'm, I'm going up and down the inclines because treadmill running to me, it's just biomechanically not the right thing to do. Yeah. You're, you're running, oh, you're moving, you're moving, you're in place on a moving surface which is different. Normally you're walking over a relatively stationary surface. Yeah. You're, you're missing one third of the entire gate. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, so it's, it's a, it's a false, it's false stimulation into the body. So if I'm going to use a treadmill, I prefer walking up or I get on, um, I get on the woodway curve and I'll run 30 seconds at a time. I'll, I'll do like a 30 second run and walk with there. I'll do a 30, 30 interval. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I look at doing that lifting two or three days a week, cardio training two or three days a week, mobility workouts one or two days a week. And for me, mobility could be a yoga class or just body weight, lunge matrix movement, different mobility patterns on the ground. And then 50s, 50s, you should still try to do the same thing, but understand you probably need an extra day between really hard workouts. So if you do a hard workout on a Monday, Tuesday, go out for a long walk or go out for a hike or, or, or an easy bike ride. Then Wednesday, come back and hit it hard. You know, when you're in your 30s and 20s, you can hit it hard almost every day. But now in my late 40s, about to, I got a little bit more than 12 months away from 50. I know that I got about two, maybe four good workouts in me a week and just be able to, to manipulate it from there. And then when you get in your 60s, 
one to two hard workouts a week for strength training and one or two good, really hard, hard breathing workouts for cardio. And I'd say in your 60s and 70s, and then by the time you get to your 80s, just you stay active. And I really, the one thing that makes me sad, dude, is when I see older adults, these older adult fitness classes sometimes, and they have people in chairs. I mean, I get it. I get, and I see this at the YMCA, and I just, they're, they're, they're safe for the sake of being safe. But man, if you can stand, if you can walk, if you can move around, you should be strength training. You should be training on your feet. I don't understand sitting down for an exercise class, but something is better than nothing. So if you're in your 80s and you're doing chair aerobics, that's better than sitting in the chair and just watching Fox News. So, um, <laughs> but it really is. It's just it's being active and trying to find ways to be active every day. Do something every day where you get your heart rate up and you breathe a little bit quicker. Yeah, it's really that simple. Well, Pete, we've been going we've been going for a while now. Where can those that are interested find your work, pick up your books, or connect with you directly? Yeah, no, thank you, man. Um, Pete McCall Fitness is my website, PeteMcCallFitness.com. And I try to blog there about once a week. And I, I cover things from like tissue, uh, from like mobility work, sleep. You mentioned, I, you mentioned the recent post about every decade of the life cycle. So I try to put a lot of information there. The All About Fitness podcast, I try to put up a new episode every week. Right now, I'm doing a little thread on training for the tactical athlete. So last oh, week, right. I did a researcher who um, does research on firefight fitness for firefighters and law enforcement. This week, I put up a guy named Aaron Quinn, who is the uh, fitness trainer for the Oakland Fire Department, Oakland, California Fire Department. Oh, interesting. And, and what's interesting, Nick, he makes meditation a key component of their fitness program for the fire department. I love it. Right? And why do you think that is? I was fascinated. This blew me away. Why do you think that is? Because of the the neural pathways, it stimulates. When you're in a fire situation, he wants his firefighters to be able to calm down, to have that ability to breathe, and because it what it has to do with wearing their air tanks. I mean, yeah. this is fascinating, right? He's like he's like I've found that if my guys learn how to meditate, then when they're wearing their air tank, when they're when they're wearing an air tank fighting a fire, their air they use their air they they conserve their air longer. I'm sure they also practice breath work then. That's what he said. They practice breath work. They practice meditation. And you, normally you think of firefighters as being like, yeah, we're lifting heavy stuff. But no, you're practicing breath work. And next week I'm releasing an uh, interview I did with uh, a Navy SEAL who used to run part of the BUDS program. So I, 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 what I try to do on All About Fitness is I try to run like three or four episodes in a row on the same topic. And it all comes back to how to use exercise to enhance the quality of life. So there's All About Fitness, the podcast. The same name on the YouTube channel. I have a couple uh, workout ideas up on the YouTube channel. I try to put little tidbits up there. I put interviews up there. And I just, I mean, like I said, this stuff comes easy to me. And I try to share it with as many people as possible. Then in my books, are age, Ageless Intensity comes out in August. And that's the high, how high intensity slows down the aging process. Then my first book, Smarter Workouts, it's what I've been teaching personal trainers for almost 20 years now. Smarter Workouts is how to design workout programs for mobility, metabolic conditioning, what most people call cardio and strength training. So I just, I make those resources available so people can learn how to do exercise in an effective way. Not that there's right or wrong, but, but find what's effective and efficient for them. There's sometimes right and wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's going to work? I mean, I, I always look at exercise, Nick, as like taking as directions, right? You can either take, take, take the train, you could walk, you could ride a bike, you could take a cab. What's going to get you from point A to point B the quickest way possible? The way that doesn't get you injured. That's just it. Which, which is going to be the easiest way, right? I mean, so if you're hitchhiking, probably not the best way to get from point A to point B. You know, riding a little girl's bike might not be the best way to try to get across Midtown in the middle. You know, so you got to look, so you can extrapolate that analogy out, but it really is. You're trying to get from point A to point B, which is your goal and the safest, most efficient way possible. Mm -hmm. All right, I have one more question for you before the lightning round. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Imagine that there's a worldwide burning of the books. All information on earth is gone, but you get to save the content from three creators, three teachers. It can be anything from podcasts to YouTube videos, your, I guess your own podcast, uh, books, you name it. What would you choose and why? Oof. Wow. Um, for podcasts, 
this might be somewhat controversial because I don't always agree with his opinions, but he has such a wide range of, of guests on. I'd have to be, it'd be split between either Joe Rogan or Tim Ferriss because mm. they both do a good job of interviewing really people that aren't always that walk the same line. And, and that's where I don't always agree with Rogan's opinions, but I, I do like the fact that he has people on from all, all avenues, right? I mean, to have Tulsi Gabbard on, who I might not agree with to at least find out why she thinks that way. I think, cause I think that that's what we can all benefit from is asking yeah. why a little bit more often um, from writing. I'm trying to think of, of the writing world of, of who's spoken to me. And this might be a little bit of a outlier. So it's not necessarily fitness, but I'm a big fan of a guy named Graham Hancock. Uh, Graham Hancock is a, is British and he's been writing for years about, the fact that the earth has a different history than we think it might, or that, that the earth might have a different, that humankind might have a dis- different history. He, he wrote a book, a great book called Supernatural on the use of psychedelics in like shamanic rituals. Hmm. And that's when, after I read that, I had a very interesting conversation with Paul Check about the use of, because uh, Paul is actually a shaman for rated as a shaman. And we had a, a very interesting conversation with Paul about like mescaline and, and ayahuasca um, but Graham Hancock would be one of the writers. So you have either Joe Rogan or Tim Ferriss, Graham Hancock. And then from exercise, I'm kind of like it doesn't exercise. Need to be ex- anything. It doesn't need to be exercise. Well, I'm trying to think if I'm going to go exercise or politics. Um, and politics, I think the one book that I, I would want to save just from what I read, and, and I was a political science uh, major in college, would be, um, would be the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers was um, Alexander Hamilton, Jefferson, and John Jay writing about the different reasons for setting up the government the way they did. And, and they had some very insightful stuff. I mean, they wrote this stuff back in the 1770s and 1780s that still it very much applies today. You know, wow. ambition, I think Federalist 51, ambition must be made to counteract ambition and the whole idea of factions. And so that would be the Federalist Papers is a great, if people haven't read that, and you've seen the play Hamilton, picking up the Federalist Papers would be a good insight into, into how our government's structured. I like that question. That's a good question. Okay. On to the lightning round. What's the best or worst advice you've received? Best advice was when I was graduating college. My mother's good friend, um, uh, Kirchen, uh, my mother, Terry Kirchen. Terry Kirchen told me, keep my resume and my passport current. She's like, no matter what you do in life, keep your resume and your passport current. And uh, I, every every 10 years, I, I renew my passport as soon as I can. And I have to say, that's led to some of my international travel opportunities as a fitness educator. Awesome. I made the mistake of letting my passport expire this year because of COVID. There's huge delays. So yeah, I, yeah. I didn't have a passport for about three months. Oof. Yeah, my passport was getting ready to expire in January of 2022. And I went ahead and uh, renewed it because certain countries won't let you in um, if your passport's uh, less than six months away from expiring. Mm. So I went ahead and just redid it recently. So yeah, keep your passport. I, and I have to say, man, that is some of the best advice. Keep your passport and your, and your resume current. Yeah. What's the number one thing that you believe that very few people do? Number one thing that I believe in that, hmm, that very few people do. Your most controversial opinion. Honestly, I, I, you know, I, I believe in just that there's a lot out there we don't know. There's a lot more out there that we don't know, like, right? And I'm fine with that. <laughs> like, all this thing about, I mean, we now, we've had so much other stuff going on in our, in our society the last year. The government now acknowledges that we have UFOs or whatever they call it, a whatever they call it, the, the unidentified air, aerial phenomenon, UAPs. <laughs> and and so I firmly believe that there's, there there are energies out there, there are entities out there, there are energies out there that we don't fully comprehend. Whether that extra dimensional, interdimensional, I, I, that part I don't know and I'm not going to pretend to know. But when you look at the different, uh, different possibilities out there that I am fully comfortable with the fact that there are things out there that we can't explain. Yeah. And I, fir- I firmly believe that. Whether you want to call them ghosts, you want to call them aliens, you want to call them interdimensional beings, I, I don't know. But I just know that we are not the end all be all of creation and that there are other entities, other energies out there, other life forms out there that we've yet to really understand. And that, I'm fine with that. I, I, I believe that to the death of my soul, yeah. that there are other things out there, right? Yeah. 
What's something that your tribe doesn't know about you? Something that my tribe doesn't know about me. Probably that thing, probably that, that I am really open to the idea of just like, I have a very open mind, I think, which can surprise some people because I look relatively clean cut, relatively whatever conformist, but I really, I'm, as long as you're not harming other people, as long as you're not doing is doing any harm to other people, I really frankly don't, don't care. And, and I'm really open to all possibilities and ideas. And, and to be honest, I love hearing from people with different opinions and I may not agree with their opinion, but you know what? I, I'm really open to hearing why you might think that way. And sometimes it gets a little tiresome to hear that, but, <laughs> but I really am. I, I think we, we can do a much better job by just being open-minded and saying, Hey, tell me about that. Why do you feel that way? Or why do you think that? And I just really think there's a lot that we can learn from that. So I think a lot of people might not, not realize I'm as open-minded and just as, as accepting and tolerant as I am. I think that's absolutely key because the second we get caught in a belief system and we're not willing to entertain other perspectives, you stop learning, you stop growing. And all of a sudden you're stagnating. You know, people have certain beliefs. doesn't mean I agree with them. It just means that I understand they have those beliefs and they have a right to those beliefs. And I want to understand why they have those beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well, Pete, how would you like to conclude our journey together tonight? I just want to say thank you and thank your listeners, man. I love these conversations. And I don't know about you, Nick, but one of the things I love about doing the podcast is, is just having these conversations and learning something. Because I have found that selfishly, I, I'll say this, that selfishly, I got an education because I found the best way to learn is by teaching others. So to me, this is very selfish because I like learning new things. If there's an art, like I just wrote um, an article series for the American Council on Exercise on Hormones the hormones that react to, to, to exercise. And I wanted to learn more about hormones. So I pitched the idea of the article series and uh. got to do a deep dive on understanding hormones. So I really having these conversations really means a lot to me. So I thank you for your time. Yeah. I'm a big fan of learning in public and getting to research and at the same time, put something out there. So I'm with you on that. And thank you for your time tonight. You've been very generous with it. We've been going for quite a while now Man, never stop. I mean, the only time I've not exercised consistently is when I had Lyme disease back in 2004. Mm -hmm. I got bit by a tick from mountain biking, and I really I could barely move around the block. But there are some days where walking around the block was all I could do. But as soon as I got back to it, man, I, but knock on wood, having yeah. kids, traveling, just no matter what, workouts can be shorter, they can be easy, but just never stop. Yeah, you can accommodate it to any lifestyle. Yeah. Well, I'm Nick Urban here with Pete McCall tonight, signing out of mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. Dot com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any life changes.